Um, you mentioned governance and, and leaders. Uh, I'd like you to talk about two things, recruitment and director quality. Where, where should we be going? Yeah, I think we're seeing a change in, again, member-based organizations. You exist because of the membership and the dues they pay into the system, and there's been a long-standing traditional acceptance that the people that are using the service should also be the people that are making the decisions about the people that are using the service. And I think that mythology has sort of come unraveled, and maybe it was 2008 that caused everybody to look a little more closely at the, their efficiencies. Um, if you look at other, uh, again, more publicly accountable organizations, and not-for-profits in particular, they usually have a higher level of accountability. There needs to be some transparency in the decision-making and the, the metrics that are used to measure their success. Member agencies operate in a little bit of a cocoon because you really can do more or less whatever your members empower you to do. And the average member in a, in a, in a member-based association like this probably isn't paying close enough attention to even know. There's a small percentage of people that know, but most of them are out there just hoping you're doing the best job you can. It's really insufficient from a director liability perspective to not understand your, your legal liabilities and your obligations when you sign on as a, corporate, as a director of a not-for-profit corporation. I think, again, the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act and proceeding at the Canadian Not-for-Profit Corporations Act really brought to the forefront some of the uh, more archaic natures of not-for-profits in this country and how they were organized over the last century. Uh, the legislation itself was even 100 years old, so not even refreshing, right. you know, bringing not-for-profits into the, into the world of governance as the for-profit model had, uh, had said before. So that said, you've got to transition from what you were to what you need to be, and that transition's been difficult. I think there's a lot of people that saw uh, directorship as a way to uh, be networked with one another, to uh, learn about their organization, to be closer to the issues. Uh, some people still like the, uh, in the inclusion, to be involved in things and to be participating in things, so actually engaged in the organization by being a director. And yet, many of the times we do board assessments, and I know my colleagues here do lots of them as well, uh, you found out that many people just didn't have the clear understanding understanding or skills to do the job that they'd actually signed on and were legally bound to do. So as organizations become more accountable to members and have to be transparent with how you're using members' money, it's important that members know that when they're voting people into those positions, they have to vote the absolute best qualified people into those positions. It's not who you know or who cut your lawn or you know how long you've been uh, going to the club together. It's really about making sure that the directors that sit around that table that are charged with millions of dollars of their money have the skills as a director to be informed decision makers, to be, uh, to be conscious of someone else's money and to not waste it. And I'm finding that every board that we've been working with for the last you know, at least five or six years is seeing that board assessment tool as being a way to determine director capacity. And where there's a lack in director capacity, there's been a real motion towards adding new standards or qualifications for bringing on new members. Excellent. I think, and I think in a, in, a, in a very practical way, as we begin to think about, well, how do we now translate this um, for those that, whether they're involved in nominating committees, they're providing uh, input as, as members of a board and discussion, EOs as well, we, we come back to the fundamentals of, firstly, what business are we in as real estate boards? What are those things that we do to deliver value to members? And from a governance perspective, what skill set is therefore required around the board table to assist us to deliver on that, whatever that value proposition is? And of course, emanating from that, we begin to get a competency grid. We begin to have a sense of what exactly are the skills that we need to be seeking in directors. Uh, it's not so much an evaluation of people who continue to populate the board, but as they leave, as they perhaps retire or their terms of office conclude, it's an opportunity collectively to then say, well, you know what, we had somebody here who was particularly well connected on advocacy PAC related issues, they're active politically, uh, that's a gap. If we lose, lose Susan or George, we're going to have a gap. And that's a key competency that we need to have represented. If it's not represented, of course, in our EO, then we now begin to think about who might we draw in and, and attract to, to this role that has those necessary competencies. Great. I just want to mention, too, I see Andrew Peck here from Vancouver. And I'm aware that the Vancouver Real Estate Board has two outside uh, members that sit on the board who are not realtors. I, th I believe one's a lawyer. And I think the other's an accountant. So talk about skills you need at a real estate board. And they, and BCREA. So in my understanding is those individuals get right to the point, <laughs> they get through the clutter, and they, and they get to the decision quickly.